Hey, are you on a gluten-free diet and continue to feel sick? This is an episode you don't want to miss. We're going to be talking all about the foods that mimic gluten. We'll be right back. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Gluten mimickers, foods and compounds that can actually mimic the action of gluten making you sick or keeping you sick. So, as we've talked about in earlier modules, many people go on gluten-free diets and don't recover. Uh, as much as in some studies, as much as 92% of individuals on a gluten-free diet still continue to have persistent damage. So understanding gluten mimickers is going to become a very, very important part of your knowledge base. So we're going to be talking about the six primary gluten mimicking categories today. One of them are the gluten-free grains, and we'll dive into that shortly. Another are the pseudo-grains. And then we have group number three, which is dairy. And then we have meat glue. And then number five is coffee, and number six is sugar. So we're going to go through these each in turn and discuss why, uh, why they can mimic gluten, how they can mimic gluten, what you need to be concerned about, and what you can do. So stick with us as we dive in. So first, let's talk about pseudograins. These are the most commonly confused for grains. If you don't know what the pseudograins are, it's your quinoa, your amaranth, and your buckwheat. They're technically not grains. Um, but again, they're oftentimes processed in facilities that also process grains. So one of the biggest problems with pseudograins is the cross-contamination issue. A lot of them are cross-contaminated with enough gluten to create damage. Remember, how much gluten creates damage? It's 20 parts per million is the general accepted scientific rule of thumb, which is the size of a breadcrumb. So it doesn't take a lot of gluten cross-contamination to potentiate an inflammatory response. And some research shows that one exposure to gluten can create an inflammation that can last as long as two months. And again, this goes back to why so many people don't get better. Maybe they're gluten-free, they're getting these gluten-mimicking foods, and they're getting them consistently enough over time that the inflammation just continues to perpetuate. So, quinoa. There are studies that have shown that quinoa proteins can mimic gluten. So beyond the cross-contamination issue, quinoa... Uh, again, research shows that quinoa can actually, there's a couple of different proteins in quinoa that look so similar to gluten that many people with gluten issues react to quinoa as well. And so that being the case, quinoa is one of those, it's, it could be dangerous for you if you're trying to be gluten-free, truly gluten-free. Again, the true gluten-free diet, it, it, it excludes quinoa for that reason. We know that buckwheat uh, is another one that many studies show that buckwheat has issues with cross-contamination. The same thing goes with amaranth. And many experts believe that these, these pseudo-cereals are so similar to grain, to gluten, that they haven't been adequately studied to be really recommended as a staple source of food. So again, um, word of caution with those pseudo-cereals or those pseudo-grains. My advice, if you want to follow the true gluten-free diet, is go ahead and avoid them, especially that first six months as you're trying to navigate and learn this diet and figure out how to regain and recapture your health and wellness. So another you know, reminder on, we've talked about this in a number of our, our modules in the, in, the, in, the, in the past, and that is the, the actual, what are being considered the gluten-free grains. Okay, now as I've talked about, there's really technically, there's no such thing as a gluten-free grain if you know the botanical definition of what gluten actually is. Gluten is the name of the storage proteins found in all grains, and so, uh, but according to food labeling laws, gluten is only known as alpha-gliadin, which is found in wheat, barley, and rye. So again, if you haven't watched module one of this series, it's one of the most critical modules to watch because I give you the scientific breakdown of these different definitions and, and a better understanding of why. But remember, corn is one of these gluten-free grains that can really trigger a response, and it's because corn has a type of gluten in it called zane, and there have been numerous studies that have shown that people with gluten sensitivity have trouble healing when you add corn into their diets. And so corn is definitely one on the hot list, on the high list of foods that you definitely want to avoid if you're trying to follow a true gluten-free diet. Rice is another. Rice contains a type of gluten protein called orzenin. Okay, rice 
proteins in general have been linked to something called enterocolitis, meaning inflammation of the intestine. It's actually one of the more common causes of intestinal inflammation in industrialized countries. And there are a number of reasons for this. One, I think, is because of the gluten-based protein. But two, many of your rice components have heavy toxic metals in them. Cadmium and arsenic are found in high levels of a lot of our rice products that are made for the gluten-free market. A number of studies have shown that, uh, that rice products predominantly made for the gluten-free market are commonly contaminated with these toxic heavy metals that can also cause inflammation and, and other types of damage to your organs and tissues. And so that can, again, lead to a manifestation of problems if you just turn away from wheat, barley, and rye, but implement tons of rice in your diet, you might actually start becoming sick as a result of these heavy metal toxins. Oats is another one oftentimes labeled as a gluten-free grain, although technically it's not gluten-free. The type of gluten in oats is called avenin. And this is a really common one used in a lot of lotions and hygiene products as well. So be on the lookout for avenin, that term avenin, in these different products that you might apply to your skin, especially if you're struggling with a type of skin inflammatory disorder, something you know like eczema, psoriasis, or vitiligo, because these are, these are areas where we see that people tend to react to gluten in skin-based products when they already have pre-existing skin inflammation. Now again, oats have a gluten in them, and additionally, studies have shown that oats are oftentimes cross-contaminated with wheat, barley, or rye glutens, but also studies have shown that the avenin protein in oats actually can create an inflammatory reaction in those with gluten sensitivity. So multiple reasons why I would suggest that you look at oats with caution. And um, again, if you're going to follow a true gluten-free diet, get them out of your diet. Same thing with millet. Millet's another grain that's commonly considered to be gluten-free, but yeah, as, as some research has shown that, that it hasn't been well enough studied to actually be considered safe. Sorghum falls in the same category. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of your sorghum-based beers um, that are claiming to be gluten-free on the market, many people buy. I don't recommend them. I don't recommend sorghum in your diet. It's just not one of those that is technically gluten-free. The caffeine or the caffeine in, in sorghum hasn't been adequately studied. And as we've learned from the history of studying other grains, generally speaking, grains for a gluten sensitive individual is going to trigger that genetic interrelationship that leads to an inflammatory response. So just a quick crash course reminder, if you haven't watched module one on why we want to avoid the grains that are labeled gluten free. Now let's dive into dairy, one of the other gluten mimickers. Some research shows that the protein in dairy called casein can mimic gluten and create an inflammatory response. And, and this goes back to how similar the two proteins are. Gluten and casein are extremely similar. A lot of autistic communities have evolved to a gluten-free diet, but then even one level above that, they've evolved to what's called a gluten-free casein-free diet. And this has to do with that dairy cross-reacting and looking potentially like gluten to the body. As many as 50% of those with celiac disease reacted to dairy casein proteins in research, and I'll show you some of that here shortly. But then there's also processing of dairy foods that occurs that can interfere uh, with the structure of dairy and make dairy a more reactive food. I'm going to put a diagram up on the screen for you. These are what I call the dairy dangers for the gluten sensitive individual. And you'll see as we go around this diagram, there's several different things that we want to be concerned with. Number one, on the far right top of this diagram are the added gums. Now, some of the gums that are added to dairy products. Now, generally with milk, you're not going to see gums being added. Where you'll see this is things like yogurt and ice cream and confections that are produced from dairy and even some of the cheeses. But one of the most dangerous gums for somebody with a gluten issue is carrageenan gum. This type of gum is derived from a type of seaweed and it's used as a thickening agent in dairy products and it's been shown in many research studies to cause gastrointestinal inflammation. So again, if you've cut gluten out of your diet to stop the gastrointestinal inflammation but you're bringing in this food gum that can also create gastrointestinal inflammation, you might be uh, just trading one bad thing for another bad thing. So keep that in mind. Make sure you check any dairy products for different food-based gums. There's a number of different kinds. We've actually got a really long article on the different gums and the, the safety profile or the danger profile of them. You can check that out at glutenfreesociety.org. There's also added hormones. A number of your dairy products, um, recombinant bovine growth hormone, 
uh, the way the animals are fed. This can actually change the chemical composition of the milk, making the milk not necessarily gluten, but not healthy for you, right? Remember when we feed a cow predominantly grain in their diet, as I've mentioned before, we don't know, nobody's really researched this, it's actually on my slate to research, is when you feed cows grain, does that gluten show up in the dairy of the animal? We know it does for humans. When humans eat gluten, it shows up in their breast milk. We don't know that about cows, it's just not something that's been researched at this point, but it is a point of caution. I would say proceed uh, with dairy with extreme caution and, and if you're going to use any dairy at all I would recommend that it's grass-fed dairy versus you know your commercial feedlot type of dairy production um, you know mass scale dairy production uh, milk products then we have what's known as molecular mimicry of gluten so this is what I was referring to the casein molecule for many has crossover with gluten and again 50% of celiac patients are re known to react to the casein in dairy and so you may be one of those and so that makes dairy a, a potentially bad choice because of its gluten mimicking capability. There's also a, pro a protein in dairy called BCM7 that stands for beta casomorphin 7. This was discovered because it was actually discovered by researchers in New Zealand where the, the, the children of the native peoples of New Zealand were developing type 1 diabetes at record rates. And the only reason they could ascertain as to why that was happening was because they were feeding these children a lot of dairy, which wasn't part of their diet before, and it was dairy coming in from these, again, industrialized cows that produced a specialized type of casein called BCM7 which is a protein that induces autoimmune disease. And so this is, look, this is the type of dairy that most of our dairy farmers use in the United States. Um, as a matter of fact, in New Zealand, um, they've gone, they've, they've started to convert their herds of dairy cattle to what are called A2 producing dairy. A2 is the genetic of the cow. There's, there's A1 cows and there's A2 cows. Well, A1 cows produce BCM7 as a protein in their milk, and we know that protein can induce autoimmune disease. Look, we know gluten can induce autoimmune disease, so it doesn't do you a lot of good to get rid of gluten and then continue to use a dairy product that can continue to perpetuate a pre-existing autoimmunity. So if you're going to do dairy again, you've got to be aware that that A1 dairy has that BCM7 protein, and if you're going to use dairy at all, it needs to be grass-fed a2 genetic cows like that would be the the cream of the crop if you will if you're going to choose dairy and that's if you're not allergic to it or if you're not reacting to the casein as a gluten mimicry component and again most of the people in my experience going on a gluten-free diet struggle until they take the dairy out of their diet so i would just share my experience with you so that you could have that you know to make a better choice for yourself then there's also something that happens in gluten sensitivity. Remember, gluten damages the GI tract. And as it damages the GI tract, it, it also damages your ability to produce an enzyme called lactase. Now, lactase is the name of the enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is the sugar that's found in dairy. And so years of gluten-induced intestinal damage actually makes people gluten, or rather makes people dairy intolerant, right? Lactose intolerant. And so if you're using a lot of dairy, uh, but your gut is damaged and doesn't produce adequate lactose, or rather lactase, um, you might find that using dairy creates a lot of gas, bloating, irritable bowel-like syndrome problems for you. So again, just one other reason why dairy can be problematic for those with gluten or history of gluten sensitivity. And then there's one last one, and that's meat glue. And I've mentioned meat glue several times, but meat glue is used as a thickening agent in a lot of dairy products. And researchers are showing that when you add this particular bacterial enzyme to process food with, then it changes the nature of the proteins in that food, and it can make them more resemble gluten, creating the potentiation of inflammation and leading to or contributing to autoimmune disease. So those are really the top six reasons why you should look at dairy as a potential problematic food. And again, dairy is one of those gluten mimickers. Now I'm gonna put a research study up on the screen for you here as well. You can see in this study, mucosal reactivity to cow's milk protein and celiac disease. Here's what the researchers found. Um, 10 of the 20 patients showed a similarly strong inflammatory reaction to cow's milk challenge. Six of the cow's milk sensitive patients were challenged with specific cow milk proteins 
specifically casein and something called alpha lacto or lactalbumin. And then casein, in contrast to alpha lactalbumin, induced an inflammatory response similar to that produced by cow's milk. A mucosal inflammatory response similar to that elicited by gluten was produced by cow's milk protein in about 50% of the patients with celiac disease. Casein in particular seems to be involved in this reaction. So again, this is not a study done on massive quantities of people, but it just showed, again, of the 20 people in this study group, 10 of them were reacting to casein the same way they were reacting to gluten. And so just something to be aware of, right? Then we have this study that um, also came out on the serum, what's called serum immunoglobulin A response of patients with celiac disease. What that means is there's a, there's a protein that we all make in our mucosal linings called IgA, secretory IgA. It's our first line of immune defense. This protein is very critical. It acts for our immune system like handcuffs. It binds onto bad guys so that we can poop them out or excrete them out through our mucus, right? Because we make IgA in our, in our nasal cavity. We make it in our gut from our mouth to our anus. We make it in our lungs. We make IgA in a lot of different locations. But it's, again, it's a, it's a protein antibody that will bind on to potential toxins and help the body get rid of them. So what was found in this research study is that people consuming uh, consuming dairy, we're actually producing an IgA response to that dairy similar to what um, is produced with gluten sensitivity. So again, uh, it, 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 the study confirms that bovine milk, cow's milk uh, intolerance or sensitivity is, is not an uncommon thing in people with a history of gluten sensitivity or celiac disease. Okay, let's, um, let's next break down coffee on the list. So we talked already enough. I think we've, we've talked plenty in this series about meat glue. I want to talk a little bit about coffee and its capacity for gluten mimicry. Now, let's just be clear. I'm not trying to take away your coffee. Like many of you, maybe, you know, that coffee cup in the morning is like your, your spot of joy in the day. This is not me saying that you can't have coffee. So just calm down and listen to what I have to say here. Coffee is technically gluten-free. There is no gluten in coffee. Now, you can have instant coffee mixes that are mixed where gluten is mixed in, okay, but that's not the same thing. But whole bean coffee is gluten-free. Your instant coffees can, oftentimes can contain gluten-based ingredients. So if you're using an instant coffee, you've got to be super careful. Make sure you know the ingredients of that product so that you don't potentially get gluten, hidden gluten in that product. But so again, processed coffees and instant coffees can be cross-contaminated or contain grain elements for flavor enhancement. But there have been some studies done, actually, Dr. Aristo Vajani did a study on whether or not coffee created a mimicry effect with gluten, and he didn't find that to be the case. In essence, he didn't find that coffee stimulated uh, what's known as a cross-reactivity with gluten. So coffee doesn't necessarily mimic gluten to any large degree, um, but there are some concerns with coffee, and a lot of people struggle to heal when they're heavy coffee consumers. So who are those people? Who should be concerned about coffee consumption? There's a list, and, and I'll put that up on the screen for you here. Those with rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, Hashimoto's hypothyroid, and those with pre-existing gastrointestinal inflammation. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by pre-existing GI inflammation. Barrett's esophagitis, chronic acid reflux, if you've got a history of peptic ulcers or if you've got a history of celiac disease um, as well as Crohn's ulcerative colitis or microscopic colitis, those are all you know, kind of your inflammatory gastrointestinal diseases. So if you have inflammation in your gut and you have a disease as a result of that inflammation, if you have type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, or Hashimoto's, pay very close attention to what I'm about to tell you. I'm going to put a research study up on the screen for you because there's a, this study was published in, in Autoimmune Review in 2017. And so here's what they found. Coffee consumption seems to increase the risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 di diabetes. And they go on to say that coffee intake led to a decrease in, ins in insulin sensitivity in type 1 diabetics, meaning it, it basically it interrupted or interfered with how sensitive your insulin would work. So this is where if you have type 1 diabetes, you've got to be really careful. It also reduced the efficacy of methotrexate in rheumatoid arthritis. So if you're taking the drug methotrexate to treat your rheumatoid arthritis, you should know that the 
coffee itself led to a reduction in the methotrexate working as effectively. It also led to a reduction in thyroid medication working as effectively. So if you're, uh, again, with low thyroid and you're taking levothyroxine as a medication, know that coffee can interfere with the ability for that drug to function properly and it might make your condition worse. So you just need to be aware that coffee consumption was associated with, in this study, an enhanced development of rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes, and it was associated with a reduction in the sensitivity of medicines for type 1 diabetes and thyroid disease. Now, these researchers did find coffee consumption associated with cross-reactivity with gliadin antibodies in celiac patients. So whereas I showed you a study a moment ago that they didn't really find that correlation, this particular research study found that there was a correlation between coffee and gluten cross-reacting with each other. So again, a little bit of a mixed result there, but I, I share with you both of those, because again, I, I'm not telling you that everybody that has gluten sensitivity needs to never have coffee, I'm just simply saying that you may still be struggling, even though you're gluten-free and you're a big coffee drinker, and that may be one of the reasons why. So you've got to look at it as an from an individualized perspective. You also have to remember that quantity matters and the additives that you put in your coffee matters. Remember, coffee by itself, right, can promote reflux for many people. That caffeine can be a gastric irritant for many people. And so the more you drink, the more caffeine you're exposed to, the more of an irritant it can be. And again, if you've got pre-existing gastro, uh, gastro inflammation, then that, that in and of itself, that caffeine just might, you know, hyper irritate an already irritated lining. You know, most people use coffee as a dairy, or a sugar delivery system. So, so a lot of people don't take coffee black, they take it with all these other things. If you're that person, you have to remember that what, put, what you put in your coffee matters too. And as we just got done discussing dairy as a gluten mimicker, right? So dairy, and then there's also the non-dairy creamers, which most of those, they're made from hydrogenated oils that are highly, highly inflammatory and very unsafe. Now, um, many of them have added corn syrup, and that can be an issue as well. Many of them have GMO, natural flavors, um, and other synthetic compounds that are added, um, again, as flavor-enhancing agents. So you've got to be real careful. A lot of your you know, other non-dairy creamers, so like your almond milks and your other nut milks and things of that nature, a lot of those will oftentimes have carrageenan gum, or inflammatory gums in them as well. So just again, just a word of caution, if you're using coffee and, and you know, step one is, if you suspect the coffee, obviously you wanna remove it, but maybe you don't suspect the coffee, maybe you suspect what you're putting in the coffee. So remove the cream or take the coffee. If you're still being bothered, then now you have an answer. It just very well may be the coffee. But you can see here in this study published in the Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology, um, it's demonstrated that coffee promotes gastroesophageal reflux, okay? And that's the conclusion of the research study. So, so we've, we've got a known parameter around coffee that for many people, it causes reflux. Remember, gluten sensitivity causes reflux. If you're going gluten-free to end your reflux and it's not ending, but you're a heavy coffee drinker, you've got to look at coffee as a potential gluten mimicker and get it out of your diet. Now, I'm going to put up another slide for you here on the impairment of gastroduodenal mucosal barrier by coffee. So in, in basically in this research study, published in 2014, you see the results indicate that coffee may damage the mucosa of your GI tract, right? Your gastroduodenal mucosa if you're a habitual coffee drinker. So if you're a heavy coffee drinker or a habitual coffee drinker, it's possible that coffee itself is damaging the mucosal lining of your GI tract. And what happens when you damage the mucosal lining of your GI tract? Well, I'll tell you what happens, leaky gut happens. Remember what leaky gut causes. Leaky gut is one of the precursors, the primary origins of the development of autoimmune disease, which many of the diseases caused by gluten exposure are what? They're autoimmune diseases. And why does gluten cause autoimmune disease so well? Because it causes leaky gut. Well, again, what this research study is saying is that coffee can lead to a degradation of the mucosal lining in the GI tract, especially in heavy level coffee drinkers thus contributing to a leaky gut phenomena and subsequently potentially increasing the risk for an autoimmune process. So why coffee can be a problem, let's kind of wrap it up here. Instant coffees can contain gluten. So a lot of, not all of them, but many of your instant mixes can be cross-contaminated, not, not even necessarily cross-contaminated, but have hidden gluten in them. 
Many coffees also contain mold toxins. Now, it's important for you to understand that mycotoxins or mold toxins can mimic gluten-related symptoms as well. So, so mold exposure um, can actually mimic a lot of the symptoms of gluten. Now, most people don't eat mold, but uh, it's, it's more environmental molds where we'll see this be an issue. But coffee, as a food supply source, contains a lot of mycotoxins. And so you got to be real careful. That may be one of the reasons why coffee is contributing to your illness as well. Coffee also contains high levels of pesticides. It's one of the most heavily loaded foods in terms of pesticide usage. And so those pesticides, remember what they can do. Pesticides are basically they're antibiotics. They can destroy healthy gut flora, reduce your, your, your flora, your microbiome, and, and basically predispose you to diseases and disease associations uh, that are uh, the result of as a consequence of that. Um, and then we have caffeine in the coffee can be a problem for those with, with uh, pre-existing inflammation, but caffeine can also be a problem for those with adrenal insufficiency. So many of you have gone gluten-free, you already have adrenal fatigue or adrenal burnout, and the caffeine itself can continue to overstimulate the adrenal glands, making it harder for your recovery. So coffee can be a problem for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it mimics gluten, according to some research. Sometimes it doesn't, but there are a lot of other reasons why coffee can be a problem and you just want to consider it because it might be one of the things holding you back. So bottom line on coffee is this. Coffee is gluten-free uh, if we're talking about organic whole bean coffee, right? Many brands of instant coffees are cross-contaminated with gluten. What you put in your coffee does make a difference. So the fillers, you know, whatever you're using, dairy, non-dairy, whatever that is. Some people's immune systems treat coffee like gluten and so there may be some molecular mimicry going on there and too much coffee can damage the gut. So, as with all things, if you're drinking coffee, first step is make sure it's, you're doing it in moderation. I once asked a woman, she came to me, she says, I only drink one cup of coffee a day. I said, how big's the cup? She said, oh, you know those big stop and go mugs, you know, the ones that are free refills, 72 ounces. I said, that's not a cup. A cup is six ounces, um, generally speaking, and, and she was drinking 72 ounces a day. And so that's the equivalent of almost 14 cups of coffee. And it, there was no wonder she had severe gastric reflux that wouldn't go away. So again, size matters, um, quantity matters as it relates to coffee as well. So if you keep it reasonable, you might be able to keep that coffee in your diet. But again, many of you might be reacting to it. Okay, let's talk next about sugar. Does sugar mimic gluten? So the simple answer is no. Sugar does not mimic gluten in the way that we think. Like sugars. Uh, components of sugar don't look like gluten to your immune system and create the same kind of reaction. But here's what sugar does. Sugar creates an environment that promotes the growth of a type of yeast that's a natural inhabitant of all humans called candida, candida albicans to be specific. Candida is an opportunistic yeast and here's what that means. A lot of people tell you candida is bad and evil. No, it's not bad or evil any more than, than certain kinds of bacteria are bad or evil. It's not about uh, it being bad or evil, it's about quantity, right? When you have what's known as a yeast overgrowth, it's, it's the candida that's growing inside of you has reached a level where it starts to become a problem, but everybody has some level of candida growing inside of them. And so what sugar does is it feeds that small level of candida so that it's easier for that candida to replicate and grow more colonies or populations of more candida and so it can create an out of control scenario. So it basically it elevates candida. Now here's why that mimics gluten. Let's talk about that. So candida produces a protein called a hyphal wall protein. So imagine candida is a, a single celled organism on the surface of that candida, there's a little finger-like projection protein that it uses to grab on and hold on to things, okay? It's called a hyphal wall protein or a, an HWP. Now researchers have found that hyphal wall proteins mimic gluten. So when you have an overabundance or a yeast overgrowth with all these extra hyphal wall proteins, your body can start to turn in on that candida and it can start to look at it and think, oh gosh, we're getting exposure to gluten. And so now your body's behaving as if you're being glutened consistently. So again, sugar doesn't mimic gluten, but sugar can cause yeast overgrowth and yeast overgrowth produces excessive quantities of a protein that actually does mimic gluten. So remember, I'm gonna put a, an image up for you to kind of help you visualize this a little bit better. There's those with genetic susceptibility, right, to gluten sensitivity. We've talked about a lot about the genetics of gluten. Um, 
those individuals, it's a very common thing to get prescribed an antibiotic. It's also a very common thing for people to overconsume sugar. So you take that person with gluten sensitivity, genetics, uh, you, you, they are eating sugar on a regular basis. Now you give them an antibiotic. The antibiotic knocks out their healthy gut flora. Remember, one of the most common side effects of an antibiotic is yeast overgrowth, candida overgrowth. So the antibiotic creates a yeast overgrowth. The sugar in the diet feeds that yeast overgrowth. That yeast produces a protein that mimics gluten. And now your body's immune system, remember 70% of your immune system is in your gut lining. And so now your body's immune system is firing weapons at this hypo wall protein from yeast and you're getting this intestinal and then subsequently leaky gut and systemic inflammation that occurs, right? And so research has actually confirmed that this happens. I'm gonna put a study up. This was published in 2003 in the journal Lancet. You can see here, is candida albicans a trigger in the onset of celiac disease? So again, here's what they're saying. We postulate that candida albicans is a trigger in the onset of celiac disease. The virulence factor of candida albicans hyphal wall protein, or HWP as I've been talking about, contains amino acid sequences that are identical or highly homologous to known celiac related alpha gliadin and gamma gliadin T cell epitopes, meaning that this basically what all that fancy wording means is that yeast produces a protein that has amino acid sequences that are identical to gluten. And so the people with gluten sensitivity that have these yeast overgrowths are basically being glutened and it leads to the development or contributes to the development of gastrointestinal damage that it, it's hallmark of celiac disease. So again, this study confirms it. And then we have another study here published in 2015. And you see here, humoral immunity links candida albicans infection and celiac disease. And so this, this study was looking at the protein, the hypha wall protein expressed on the pathogenic phase of candida albicans presents sequence analogy with the gluten protein gliadin. I mean, again, and just another study confirming that this protein produced by candida mimics gluten, okay? and that this leads to the potentiation of triggering gluten-related disorders in these individuals with yeast overgrowth. Okay, so important to know, if we're looking at gluten mimickers, again, kind of recapping what we talked about in this module, we know that grains that are considered or labeled gluten-free can be a problem, okay? And that's part of the, why we developed at Gluten-Free Society the true gluten-free diet. Again, go back and watch module one. So we know gluten-free grains uh, are gluten mimickers. We know that pseudo-grains are gluten mimickers. Dairy as a group can be a gluten mimicker. Meat glue can be a gluten mimicker. Coffee can be a gluten mimicker. And sugar, not necessarily because of the sugar, but because what it leads to, which is yeast overgrowth, can also trigger a mimicry of gluten exposure leading to the symptoms or the disease states associated with gluten sensitivity. Hey, if you need more guidance going gluten-free, I've got a, a free gift for you below in the description. Sign up for free for our Glutenology Masterclass with over 14 hours of video tutorials to help you best navigate your gluten-free diet successfully and restore your health. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.